Welcome to another edition of Motoring 88. The real fun is on the road. This is Jim Kenzie from Motoring 90. I'm Phil Gardner from Motoring 88. This is the Two Minute Test Drive. We begin with a couple of quotes. First, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. The other, not as eloquent as Shakespeare, hey, let's 86 it and start all over again. Okay, I know what you're saying. What am I smoking? But bear with me, because you know that Shakespeare quote could refer to a company called Toyota. Now, as we know, they are trying to attract a much younger audience to the Scion brand. The question is, so Toyota have said, who cares about demographics? Just put a Toyota badge on it. Well, all I can say is unless this vehicle attracts more people into the showroom, Toyota just might run out of patience. That was at the launch of the Scion IM, and as we said back then, consumers weren't really excited about this brand, but they might be if they threw a Toyota badge on the vehicles. Well, shortly after, Scion was dead. However, the Scion FRS and the IM survived, and they now sport a Toyota nameplate. And thus the question, what's in a name? I'm not surprised Scion has gone away. I don't think it'd be lamented. There's, there, was, there wasn't a lot of iconic cars in its lineup. And in fact, the two that are coming back, the GT86 was a long time ago a, a Toyota, and the IM most recently was the Matrix. So there you go. The Corolla is what built Toyota in Canada, and to have IM associated with the Corolla brand, the top selling car in the history of the automobile, and the mainstay of our business, is I think a really important thing for IM and for Toyota. Um, and this means that as a result of attaching the Corolla nameplate to it, this vehicle is now going to be available in every Toyota dealership, coast to coast. I think that's a great thing for our dealers, and it's a great thing for our customers. When it comes to hybrid, Toyota comprises about 70% of the market for hybrids in Canada. And I think that's just going to uh, step up another mark with the launch of the Prius Prime. This vehicle is the most fuel efficient vehicle in the marketplace. Well, I think this is the first serious attempt Toyota's made at a plug-in hybrid vehicle. The last one was a very timid affair. In fact, I don't think uh, Toyota really wanted to make it. I think it was a marketing team decision foisted on the engineers. This one is a much more serious attempt. They've doubled the battery power to 8.8 .8 kilowatt hours. And so it's really quite a different car. It's a much, much better car. On some, some vehicles, you need to plan your route from A to B to C to D to get to your ultimate destination. Whereas, you know, with this electric and gas vehicle, you can have that spontaneous road trip where I want to drive around this road, I want to see what's down there, and there's no worry about getting to your next destination to say charge your vehicle. あの、距離もさることながら冬場のヒーターだとか、あとは冬の走り出しとかそういったところもEVで走れるので、もうEVでそのいろいろ走る機会をお客様に非常にま広くレンチを上げられたってところです。they claim you can go 135 kilometers an hour, I think, on EV power alone. There were cops around here in Southern California, so I didn't try that. I got it up to about 120, no problem at all. In fact, it was quite sprightly, quite torquey. It's actually as fast in pure electric mode as it is in hybrid mode when the gas and electric motors are working together. Based on target EPA estimates for fuel economy, it has a range of 965 kilometers, which is, for example, a, a trip from Toronto to Ottawa and back on a single charge and a single tank of uh, gas. The people who purchase this vehicle are often focused on the environment and also, in our case, their image because the style is very enhanced in terms of its bold look. You'll see in the front fascia, in the lights, and, and also the 11.6 inch available screen on the inside. It's stylish and high technology, but also very usable. You don't need an electric car anymore. You can get 35 or 40 kilometers of EV only range with this Prius Prime. Then after you're done with the electric power, it'll get about four to five liters per hundred kilometers. Who needs a Tesla? Kodomo, 
、えーまあ、減らす小石油とあとは石油を、まあ、あの使わない脱石油の両方の技術が、えー、車としてやっぱりあの伸びて、えー、いくと思いますなのであのよりその環境に対して、えー、いい車が今後増えていくというふうに予想しています It's about as exciting a time as I can imagine you know, through the entire history of the auto industry to date There's a lot of really interesting、uh, advancements that,、uh, that I, I think are really going to shake up the auto industry in, in the next five to ten years. License plates on the road that don't tell me anything more than that does. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Motoring TV is brought to you in part by Stark Auto Sales, a better way to buy a car. Model have been left withering on the vine for way too long, almost a decade, so a revamp was long overdue. On this edition of Test Drive, the GMC Acadia. The 2017 Arcadia's changes are manifold. First, it's significantly smaller and it receives a host of safety upgrades. The improvements drag GMC's mid sized offering into the here and now. Of the changes, the biggest is found in the dimensions. The wheelbase shrinks by 162mm to 2857, it's 184mm shorter and 87mm narrower. This means it's now 318 kilograms lighter than its predecessor. This not only helps fuel efficiency, it helps the driving d y n a m i c s enormously. Now, in spite of the downsizing, this Acadia still has more than its fair share of versatility. There are five, six, and seven passenger versions, and if you fold all of the seats down, there's up to 2,237 liters of cargo space. Now, there is a high light and a low light. The low light has to do with the six passenger version. There's a big gap between the seats. Stuff's going to disappear, so it just doesn't work. The highlight is a button inside the cabin. It allows you to limit how high the tailgate goes. In a low ceiling garage, that is smart thinking. The Denali, in spite of its size reduction, is still a large ride, but one that handles adroitly. There is minimal body roll, and yet the ride quality is pretty good. The secret lies in the fact the optional adaptive suspension reads the road and then adjusts the damping every two milliseconds. The suspension is a $1,400 option and it requires all wheel drive, but it's money well spent. Throw in the sharp steering setup, 235 55R20 tires, and the Acadia pushed on through the pylons rather nicely. This Acadia is offered with two different engines. The base unit is a 2.5 litre four cylinder with 193 horsepower. Now it's enough as long as it's just the driver along for the ride. Throw in a couple of passengers or some cargo and it begins to flounder. That's where the up level 3.6 litre V6 comes into its own. The larger 3.6 litre V6 makes a healthy 310 horsepower and 271 pound feet of torque, which is enough for a full complement of passengers and it adds the ability to handle a 1,493 kilogram trailer. The refinement also takes a big step in the right direction. A modest stab at the gas sees the Arcadia step out nicely. Tromp on it and it scoots to 100k in 7.3 seconds, which is pretty quick for a 1794 kilogram crossover. 
the cabin of the Acadia takes a big step forward. These front seats, for instance, they're heated and cooled and very comfortable on a longer drive. The rest of it, well, the old design by committee look has gone out the window. In its place comes a very logical look, and at the top of it, you'll find Chevrolet's IntelliLink infotainment system. It gives fast and easy access to all of the various different functions. It also supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The V6 drives all four wheels through a six-speed manumatic. It is quick to shift and it includes a manual mode. The all-wheel drive system is also quick on the uptake and it has a number of different modes. The modes include two-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, sport, off-road and a trailer tow mode. Each alters the drivetrain characteristics to maximize traction. During the test, I only ever used normal or sport. The latter sharpens things nicely when a twisty road beckons. The system also allows the rear axle to be disconnected completely for fuel economy reasons. This Arcadia may be smaller, but it's still got room for five, six or seven passengers and the contents of a small apartment. If you are thinking about this vehicle, just make sure you tick the V6 box. Without it, not so much fun. With it, the drive comes alive. Looking ahead to motoring 90, we've already secured a Miata, and that's bound to cause a stir on the streets. We've secured the 300ZX, a real hot number from Nissan, and of course Chevrolet's new people hauler, the Lumina APV. Until September, I'm Graham Fletcher for Motoring 89. Hello, I'm Jackie Stewart. It's a great day for motoring 89, and for motor racing too. Motoring TV is brought to you in part by Dry Shine. It cleans, it shines, it seals and protects. Available at Canadian Tire and Part Source. But then when you get to the back, it does have typical pickup truck features, like the tailgate. However, this is where it gets different. This cab, and I'm gonna start right from that point again. And that's it, you're leaving? Our motoring tip of the week concerns your vehicle's suspension. Now, when you consider the abuse that it takes, it's a wonder it lasts as long as it does. I mean, it takes a pounding from potholes and all the obstacles that you hit in, this, in the course of a year or two of driving. And, and then factor in the fact that it's got all this road salt and, and slush and sand that's pelted up underneath, splashing in the summertime from rainstorms. It's a wonder that those components in your vehicle suspension last as long as they do. And also consider the fact that some of the components like the coil springs support the entire weight of the vehicle for their whole life. They're under a lot of pressure, a lot of load. Now this vehicle, you know, and, and here's, a, here's a, another thing. If you keep a vehicle long enough for enough years and enough kilometers, sooner or later, these components, as good as they are, will wear out. And that's what we've got here. This vehicle has got a broken coil spring on the left front, and it's also got the upper strut plate on the left front uh, strut has seized, the bearing in it has seized. So at low speed, if we're in a parking lot trying to turn the, the wheels extreme left and right to get into a parking space, there's an awful noise of the left front suspension. Quick inspection with a flashlight reveals that the coil spring is broken in two places and that that upper strut plate is bad. Because the vehicle is jacked up and the suspension's hanging down, we can actually remove the broken piece of the coil spring. You can see how rusty that coil spring was and it's been snapped for a while because the broken ends are all rusted as well. So fortunately, over the years, a lot of the aftermarket manufacturers have come up with prepackaged components and in this case it's going to save the motorist some money on the labor side and the fact that because it's packaged or bundled you save money on the collective cost of buying these parts individually. So the blue component is the uh, strut or shock absorber component. Uh, you can see the steering arm that's welded onto the strut on this particular model of vehicle. The lower spring seat right here also welded to the strut a rubber cushion for the bottom of the coil spring, a brand new coil spring, this gator, which is the boot that protects it, 
and the uh, jounce bumper up here, this white urethane component, and the upper strut mounting plate and isolator assembly at the top. But here's the tip. Some of these components don't produce noise or the kind of symptoms we had on this car. You can have worn out components on a car and have no perceivable problem. You can't hear anything, it doesn't sit low. You could still have a worn out ball joint that's ready to separate. So it's important on an older vehicle or high mileage vehicle that you're doing those inspections at least once a year to pick up on any of these worn components before they actually cause you a problem. That's your motoring tip of the week. On the face of it, the idea of digging up the liquefied remains of dinosaurs to power our transportation fleet, well, it sounds like kind of an odd idea. Now, we're nowhere near running out of oil, but there aren't any more dinosaurs, so eventually we're going to have to come up with something else. Now, billions of dollars of research on battery-powered cars, well, frankly, it hasn't got us a whole lot farther than we were 100 years ago. But what if we had an energy source that was virtually limitless and could be produced by a combination of solar power and water? Well, if we run out of solar power and water, we're pretty much done anyway. So that seems like an area that's worth pursuing. And of course, we have that energy source. It's called hydrogen. Now, the two things standing in the way of hydrogen vehicles are getting the vehicles that run on hydrogen and getting the hydrogen to every street corner in the country. Well, we're at least partially on the way. This is the first hydrogen vehicle available to Canadians. Six of them are so far in private hands in Vancouver, and this is the first one to be delivered in the province of Ontario. Ironically, the gentleman that owns this vehicle works for a company that manufactures and distributes hydrogen. Let's hear what he has to say about the Hyundai Tucson fuel cell vehicle. Well, the issues that we've been having uh, with fuel cell vehicles or the arrival of fuel cell vehicles, at least recently, has been uh, sort of this chicken and egg scenario of automobile manufacturers wanting to deploy uh, their latest model of fuel cell vehicle in a jurisdiction. It is my hope that with the uh, arrival of Ontario's first fuel cell vehicle, that infrastructure really needs to sort of follow the uh, the vehicle rollout if we look to see uh, zero emission fuel cell vehicles rolling on the streets of, of uh, Toronto. And it was a deliberate strategy on the part of Hyundai to make this car feel as much like a regular car as it's possible to feel. About the only compromise is that the big tank uh, which holds the hydrogen takes up a little bit of the luggage space underneath the floor of the cargo area. Being an electric car powered by an electric motor the torque is at its peak at zero RPM, so the acceleration from rest is pleasantly brisk, and there's also no vibration. It's funny that you don't even notice that there's vibration in a passenger car until you drive one that doesn't have any at all. Here we're looking at a Hydrogen X30 kilowatt fuel cell module. A module like this would either be deployed on a bus, uh, it, could be de it could be deployed on a stationary uh, generator producing power, air, that is delivered from a blower, uh, enters the fuel cell here, and hydrogen, the fuel, enters the fuel cell engine here, um, and the hydrogen and the oxygen in the air uh, react at the uh, electrode level in the fuel cell to produce electricity. That electricity can then be used to turn the wheels of a bus uh, or a truck, uh, or to put electricity back on the grid. Because the electricity for the electric motor doesn't come from a battery. There's no degradation in performance if the weather gets cold, which for Canada is obviously a huge advantage. I can totally follow uh, your point, Jim, uh, that uh, uh, digging up uh, fermented uh, dinosaur bones, as you put it, uh, uh, makes sense today and we're doing it today. Uh, but surely we can, we can sort of follow the idea that using large amounts of solar and large amounts of wind and excess renewable energy tomorrow to make our transportation fuel doesn't sound all that crazy, does it? So there's the Hyundai Tucson fuel cell vehicle. It's quiet, it's clean, it's green, and it's as normal to drive as the day is long. And the exhaust emissions, pure water. For Motoring TV, I'm Jim Kenzie. Motoring TV closed captioning 
is brought to you by Chevrolet. Find new roads. Just like in the movies, license plates are made in jail, at least in some jurisdictions. The question I have, increasingly, I'm seeing license plates that are completely illegible. The letters and numbers completely faded away, in some cases rusted away, and at least in the province of Ontario, sometimes delaminated because plates are now an aluminum base with a plastic covering laminated onto that surface. I've seen them completely coming apart. My question is, how are these drivers not stopped on a regular basis? You're supposed to have your license plate clearly visible. These aren't. Oddly enough, the Ontario Yours to Discover advertising slogan, that's always bright and clear. But the part of the plate that's supposed to identify you, you can't even see it. Now, those of a suspicious nature might wonder if the drivers are doing that deliberately so they won't be identified. Still, I don't know that drivers of silver Hyundai Elantras are necessarily the core of our criminal element in our society. Now, this is a well-known problem. The company that manages the manufacture of these plates has implemented changes to try and improve the situation. But one issue they really do have, how do you discipline a workforce that's already in jail. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, we've learned this week that Toyota made the right decision in 86ing Scion and going with the brand that got them here. And of course, that brand is Toyota. As for the Prius Prime, well, I completely agree with David Booth. With this vehicle and the Chevy Volt, there's simply no need to look at buying an electric vehicle. I mean, think about it. The basic premise of any automobile is to get you from A to B and back to A without getting a master's in navigation. It's really that that simple. Before we go, Motoring TV and the Car Guide have joined forces to bring you what we think is the best one-stop automotive site in Canada. Check out our TSN broadcast schedule and join us on Facebook and Twitter for the total Motoring TV experience. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them.